you're not getting any younger, so... Don't ask for permission. Just get out there and do it. Hey, you. Yes, you. Welcome to the You're Not Getting Any Younger podcast, a podcast for people who want to disrupt their lives for a good reason, to make it count. I'm your host, Jen Glantz, and every week, I'll drop a new episode with stories from real people just like you who woke up one morning and decided to make big changes, starting with small things. We'll cover topics like entrepreneurship, love, failure, and self-care. Hey, you're not getting any younger, so let's make this an adventure. Ready? Welcome back to another episode of the You're Not Getting Any Younger podcast. Jen Glantz here. I like to do this new thing where I share with you where I am currently recording from. No, it's not a fancy little studio. No, it's not even inside of my closet. And no, it's not underneath my bed. Currently, right now, I am recording this audio in the back seat of a car. Somebody get this girl a perfect professional studio but for now me you from the back seat of a car as I am doing laundry I have about a couple more minutes before it goes in the dryer weekend I worked a wedding as a bridesmaid for hire in South Florida if you're like what the heck is a bridesmaid for hire you have a lot to learn about me for the past four and a half years I have been working weddings for strangers as their hired bridesmaid yeah That's right, strangers hire me to show up at their wedding, wear the bridesmaid dress, walk down the aisle, give speeches for them, help them pee in their wedding dress, dance with their drunk uncle, and then when the wedding is over, never see them again. I know it sounds super crazy and I've worked hundreds of these weddings, but last weekend I worked a wedding in Florida for a bride who hired me and right before the wedding happened, I had this really crazy moment that happens to me often that I wanted to tell you about. Before it was time to go and knock on her hotel room door and enter and be her bridesmaid for the day, I felt this sudden sense of nervousness. Like knocking on the door and taking that first step was something so challenging to do. My dad drove me to the wedding and I remember sitting in the parking lot of the hotel just making up every excuse not to go inside. And I've worked hundreds of these weddings before, but I feel like every time before these weddings start, I get this weird sense of nervousness. Like taking that first step seems impossible. I know once I'm inside of the door and I'm working the wedding, I'm good at this. I know what to do. I've done it before. But it was taking that first step that just felt so scary and impossible. I lingered in the car with my dad for so long. And then finally I walked into the hotel, went up to the third floor, found the hotel room door of the bride where she was getting her hair and makeup done. And instead of just knocking on the door and walking in, I walked right past her door, found the nearest staircase, and stood inside of the staircase for a total of seven minutes, thinking about how nervous I was, how everything could go wrong, how I felt like an imposter, even though this is my business and I've been doing it so long. I felt all of this negative self-talk. And I just remember thinking to myself, the hardest part of this entire day, Jen, the hardest part of, of anything that makes you nervous is taking that first initial step. And if you can just get past that first initial step, things will start to feel normal. They'll start to feel right. And that first step is, is knocking on the door. So after seven minutes of hiding in a staircase and multiple people from the hotel just looking at me like, what is this creep doing in a hotel staircase in a bridesmaid dress looking like she's going to have a panic attack, I went to the door, I knocked on the, the, the door, and... I walked in and the second I walked in, everything felt really great. I felt like myself. I put on that that show of I'm here, I'm your bridesmaid and everything felt right. But it was just the art of getting to the door and knocking on it. That was so hard. Okay, so what does this mean for you? Look at your to-do list. What's on it? I don't want you to tell me the first five things on it. I don't want you to tell me the easy things. I don't even want you to tell me the things you're going to do today. I want you to look at that list and find the scariest thing on it, the thing that has been on that list for a week, for three months, maybe for three years. And I want you to think about one, one really tiny thing that you can do today to get started. 
I've been trying to write this fiction book and it's embarrassing because I'm talking about this fiction book all of the time but it's not really writing itself and I haven't really put the time into it. And sometimes I find that my baby step for writing this book is just staring at a blank page for five minutes. And then my second step for writing this book is just pressing letters on the keyboard. And that is the hardest part, is starting. And I want you to pick something today that you've been dreading, you've been putting off, you've been scared, you've been nervous, you've been afraid to start, and I want you to do it. Knock on that door. Stare at that blank piece of paper. Pick up the phone. Email that person. Get started. Because I promise you, my friends, my dear listeners, that that is going to be the hardest step that you ever take. I'm excited for this week's episode. We have Talia Corin. She is the founder of Work Week Lunch. She helps people meal prep the right way, saving them thousands of dollars a year on groceries, keeping them healthy, and making sure that they never, ever, ever go hungry. On this week's episode, Tali and I talk about how much money you should spend every week on groceries and hint, it's a lot less than you think, how to do meal prep if you are so bad in the kitchen, and also the kinds of things that you can make so that you don't feel like you're eating the same old stuff every single day and just craving that burger. Or for me, lots and lots of slices of pizza. Thanks so much for listening to the You're Not Getting Any Younger podcast. I cannot tell you how much it means to me that you and I are here together. If you like the show and you have 30 seconds, if you could rate and review it on iTunes, that would mean the world to me. And also, I would love to take our friendship to the next level. So come hang out with us in the You're Not Getting Any Younger secret Facebook group. There's a lot of people in the group that are waiting to meet you, talk to you, and just become your virtual online friend and more. Can't wait to see you there. Talia, I have a serious question for you. If you could only eat the same food every single day of your life, what would it be? Oh, man. I think it'd have to be sweet potatoes. No way. What about sweet potatoes (laughs) makes you feel like it is an essential food for every day? I think because you can make them sweet or savory, and they can pretty much go in any food and taste awesome. I like how you chose something healthy. Like you literally could have chose French fries, hamburgers, something, anything, but you chose sweet potatoes. I think that's good. I I value that decision. I think that's a great choice. Thank you. (laughs) So you are the founder of what I feel is a really smart business, Work Week Lunch. It's also an Instagram account. Tell us what it is and also what made you decide to start this. Absolutely. So Work Week Lunch is an online resource for all things meal prep. So that is prepping a bunch of food in advance so that you don't have to cook every day and you have whatever kind of meals you're into easily accessible. I could say healthy meals, but maybe you're not into that. That's fine. (laughs) You know, whatever you want, it's just going to be right in your fridge and you can pull it out. So I have a blog where I offer, you know, just tips, tricks, and strategies for meal planning. Some super type A and just like how to, how to really get a good plan. So you're set up for success. And then I have the Instagram where I share a lot of meal ideas. It's very visual. And then I have a subscription where I send out weekly meal plans, recipes, and grocery lists to members of the Work Week Lunch Meal Prep Program. I love this. And one of the reasons why I'm so interested in talking to you is because I've always been fascinated by the idea of meal prep, but (laughs) I have never been able to start it, mainly because I just have so many hesitations. So Hesitation number one, I have absolutely no idea how to cook. And I know that you didn't start off as a professional cook either. So how did you originally start learning how to get so efficient in the kitchen and become great at meal planning? Sure. So I started out like any person in the kitchen, absolutely clueless. There were even times like in college where I had to have my best friend supervise me cooking pasta because I'd never done it before. Me too. Same (laughs) here. Same here. (laughs) So um, after college, um, I quickly figured out that um, eating out all the time is super expensive in New York City. And I was, you know, I was making like $27,000 a year or something. And I realized I had to cook and I couldn't live off of free bagels in the office either. So um, cooking was like, I just had a hunch that would be the the cheapest and healthiest way to feed myself. Um, So I started just, you know, trying out the recipes or the, not even recipes, just the meals that I knew, like stir fries and, and like really soggy salads. Like it was terrible in the beginning. I would throw out half of what I made. And I think 
I just, I really was determined to stick with it and, and I got better at cooking. And this is kind of embarrassing, but like part of the reason why I wanted to get better at cooking, so I started dating a new guy who was still, who's still my boyfriend, but I wanted to kind of impress him. <laughs> like, I don't know. And so I did actually actively work on my cooking skills and I started to love it. I started to really look forward to um, getting in my kitchen for a few hours with like a beer and a podcast and just cooking. Um, and that's kind of how I eased into it. But the planning really came in when I realized that like I would come home with groceries and not sure what the hell I was doing. So I was like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to decide what to make before I actually go to the grocery store or before I start cooking. And that's where this planning process started developing. I love that. And I, I love that you wanted to get better to cook for your boyfriend. I had to tell you, my my current boyfriend is the only guy I've ever tried to cook for in my life during <laughs> the dating process. And on date four, I tried to make him like some taco thing. And I think it took him like a couple months into our relationship to finally be like, that was the grossest thing I've ever <laughs> eaten in my life. I secretly wanted to throw it out. So I get it. I get it. And we all get better as we try, which I think is great. I think another hesitation with meal prep, and you sort of mentioned it, is the soggy food, the bad yeah. food. Like, I look at people who meal prep and I'm like, you are a hero. But my question is, do you cook the food like all the way with all the sauces and spices and then freeze it? Or do you just like cook it plain? Like, how yeah. does this happen? There are so many ways, but the way I do it is I like to cook full meals where I don't have to do any assembly before eating it. I just want to pull it out, put it in the microwave, and just eat. I don't want to have to like pour dressing on or like mix it in a mason jar or whatever it is. So for me, I'll make like things that are just a self-contained meal, like curry with rice. It's already kind of just, it is what it is. You put it in the microwave. You can give it a stir to get the rice mixed in with the sauce, but that's it. That's um, smart. That's and, really smart. But some people do like salads and they put the dressing on the side or they'll do like a bento box situation and they build a sandwich at work kind of, you know, or a pita or something. And there's, so there are a lot of ways to do it, but um, I never, I don't really use my freezer for meals because I eat everything within four days of cooking it. So I cook it all the way and it just sits in my, it's all eaten within four days and then I do it again. I love that. Do you ever get sick of that same meal throughout the entire week or do you find interesting ways of taking those ingredients and creating multiple meals from it during that one week that's a good question uh for me i've gotten to the point where i'm looking forward to what i'm cooking because i'm good at it and it tastes really good in the beginning though it was like oh my god the salad is so soggy and gross like i don't want it um so i would say like being able to wrap your mind around repeating meals for three days comes with also getting better at cooking. I don't get sick of it because I cook um, two or three recipes per, per meal prep session. So I'm not just eating like the tacos for like lunch and dinner for three days. I can switch things around. So I'll choose like two to three recipes to switch off for lunch and dinners for three days. I love it. There's definitely a science to this in which there is. I'm going to start joining work week lunch because I'm like, I don't know if I could eat a taco for five days, but that is not what you're doing, which is no. super cool. Another thing I noticed that I loved about you and your brand is that you don't use some of my least favorite words, words like calories, macros, diets, weight loss. Like Those words just make me my, my skin boil. So what made you decide to focus on the health aspect of meal prep, keeping separate from the whole weight loss. Yeah. So this kind of goes along with the whole theme of your podcast, but I feel like ca getting into calories and macros is a life thief. That's what it's called. And I didn't, I didn't coin that term, but so I can't take credit for that, but it like, it sucks your life away because you're just like constantly thinking about the macros and calories and you're not seeing the food on a plate. You're just seeing numbers and it becomes a point of stress and it sucks the energy away from you. So that was part of the main reason why I don't include calories in anything. Cause it's just like, look guys, it's asparagus. Like, stop right. worrying about it. Right. You know? Like, it's like, look with your eyes. You know? Don't, don't worry about the numbers. And the other thing is that there, there are, another reason is that if I, even if I put calories on my meals, there's no way you could replicate the meal exactly in your kitchen and have the same number. And when I'm calculating it, it's probably wrong. Like there's yeah. just, so there's no way to really, I, I believe there's no way to really be accurate with these things. So it's like, why even bother? I love your honesty with that because I look at some Instagram accounts and they put all those numbers next to the meals and it scares people away because it's either too much or it's too low. Yeah. But it's also like if you're eating good food, health 
perhaps is better than counting all these words like macros right. and calories, right? I think that you have to cook what you like. And my, my philosophy is that if you're cooking it at home, it's going to be healthier no matter what it is, even if it's mac and cheese, because you know what's in it. You, you are in control of every ingredient. So if you don't want to use a certain type of cheese, you can buy the cheese that you do want. Or if you don't want to use a certain type of pasta, you can buy chickpea pasta or whatever it is. You know, at a restaurant, you just don't get that control. And so I believe, I really believe you can make, recreate any of your comfort foods at home and it's just going to be healthier no matter what. It's so true. If you've ever sat at like a bar or by the kitchen in a restaurant and you watch them cook yeah. pasta and they dump like a stick of butter in the pasta, I'm like, I love butter, but yeah. Yeah, but like I would never do that at home. Like I put butter on my pasta after, but they put like a legit <laughs> yeah. stick in it, you know? So yeah. I think that's completely true. Speaking of eating out, I, when 2018 came to an end, I looked over my bank statements and I was appalled at how much money I wasted eating out constantly. And one of the things you offer is a tip on on budgeting and a budgeting tool, which I have looked at and really wanted to adopt it into my life. What are some tips on creating a food budget that people can actually stick to? Sure. So um, a lot of it has to do with income, where you live, like what grocery stores are accessible to you, and also your own values. Like if you are someone who only wants to shop organic, you are naturally going to have a higher grocery bill than someone like me who doesn't care. Like, I'm like, whatever, just give me the cheapest ones. Um, and I would say that if you set a grocery budget, you should monitor like what's realistic. But like you have to test it. You can, you can, you can look at the numbers and play with it on a spreadsheet all day, but you won't know until you actually go to the store and like shop and see what happens. So if let's just say, Jen, like you found out you were spending 600 bucks a month on food for one person, which to me seems a little high, but hey, maybe like whatever, you know, um, you would then, okay, be like, I want to spend less. So I'm, next week, I'm going to try to spend like a certain amount and I'm going to go lower and lower and lower until you figure out what's comfortable. Because maybe one week you'll go too low and it's like, this is not possible. I'm running out of food. I don't feel comfortable. And then they'd be so meek. You're like, oh, I have some money left over. I Maybe I can go lower. Yeah, you know, it's funny because um, I think like January 1st, I set a, an imaginary food budget. I think I was spending maybe like 600 a month, let's say. And yeah. then this little food budget I set was like 200 a month. And my boyfriend was like, Jen, no. at least be realistic. Like, how are yeah. you going to, how do you think you're going to do this? I'm like, I know how I'm going to do this. And then we're three weeks in and I've gone way over that budget because it's not realistic. And I love how you say, like, look at how much you're spending and then see how much you can decrease it week after week. But you can't go from a thousand a month to a hundred a month because you're going to no. starve. It's just not going to work for you. And then, yeah, like 200 a month in, the, in New York City would be really, really hard, like for all your food, including takeout and groceries. I don't even think that's, I don't know how that would be really possible. No. Um, no, it's yeah. I mean, like you. Even if you go to a, any grocery store in New York City and get the essentials, it's just so much more. I, I love. This is my favorite thing to do: is go grocery shopping in New York City and then go in another city and just like <laughs> laugh so hard about how cheap it is in other cities. It was so cheap in Colorado when yeah. I lived there. Yeah, like bananas in Portland are ten cents, but then in New York mm -hmm. City they're like a dollar each. You know, yep. it's yep. wild. I I really liked on your budget too that you also had space in the budget to um, have people write in like maybe I'm going to get takeout this week or I'm going to go out with friends so and that's also with the meal prep schedule as well is writing in okay like this might yes. be date so night. you're not eating your meal preps yeah so how yeah. do you feel about people integrating takeout or restaurants or even just a coffee budget every month as well sure so I think that when with meal prep or cooking in general like if meal prep isn't your thing but you want to cook it you should plan it around what's already in your schedule so like if you know lunch at work is catered every Friday, like you don't have to plan a meal for that. If you know you have date night every Thursday night or like a you know a brunch on Sundays, like plan around those things. Don't make yourself stay home, <laughs> you know, eat eat your cooked food if like you look forward to those things. Um, so that's number one. And two, like for coffee, I mean, that's a big one for me. I drink at least one cup of day, maybe two. But I have now, I now make it at home almost every morning. But on weekends, I go out and get it. So like that's my little compromise. <laughs> I like that balance. And it's also something to look forward to. Like I've, I've also yep. been trying really hard to eat home every meal every day during the week. And then on weekends, mm -hmm. not really care as much, eat out more as almost like a celebration of, wow, you saved a lot of money and you made your own meals. So I think that's a good mental game to play as well. 
question for you from somebody in the You're Not Getting Any Younger Facebook group. Oh, this sweet. question is from Paula. She says she loves work week lunch and meal prep, but she has to admit that she is absolutely no good in the kitchen. And sometimes when she tries this, she just gets so frustrated, sort of like you, Talia, when you first started <laughs> out. What types of tips do you have for people who have really never cooked before in their life, but really, really, really want to adopt this? this meal prep philosophy. Totally. My first piece of advice would be have low expectations. Like in the beginning, even for me, when I go start a new recipe, like I honestly don't know how it's going to come out, even though I've been cooking for a while and I'm comfortable. Um, And it makes it more fun when you put less pressure on yourself. The second tip is that with cooking, unlike baking is more, it's more of an art. So you can fudge it. Like if you do make mistakes, it's usually fixable. Um, and, and like everyone on the internet has figured out every single cooking issue you could ever run into. So hit Google if when in doubt, you know, if something's not coming out right, there will be an answer for you like to figure out how to fix it. I love that. And it's so true. And and don't get so hard on yourself. Like yeah. I know I'm, I'm terrible in the kitchen and sometimes I just get so frustrated, but I also learned, okay, you know, six months ago, I could barely make the asparagus and now I'm making pretty good asparagus, you know, so you sort of can't give up on yourself. I love that you made this into a full-time job, and I want to talk a little bit about yeah. this. You used to be a talent agent for comedians, which assistant. all... I was an assistant. Okay, yeah. amazing. I mean, like, that is, like, some another person's entire life dream. So how did you make the transition from that lifestyle to, okay, I'm going to start my own business and be an entrepreneur and do it full-time? Sure. So the, the short version is that I when I became... The assistant, I was working there. For, I was working at two different places, like the, in the, a year and a half, like that's that time frame. And I just realized the culture, the path, like everything about it was just so not a fit for me. Um, it's not very innovative. That piece is not a very innovative part of the industry. Um, and I quit. I was like, you know what? I, I'm not getting younger. <laughs> like, I don't like this. So I quit. Uh, I had like a mini identity crisis at like 23 (laughs) and then um I just randomly fell into a job at Elite Daily where I was um I was first like working with influencers but then I became a staff writer and during that time I was exposed to the world of online business I was exposed to side hustling and like you know I actually had the time because I wasn't in that nine to nine job (laughs) like it was an all-day thing I finally had time to explore other interests and um, after learning about some personal finance stuff and some side hustling stuff, I realized I could build an online business and maybe get some passive income. So I actively looked into ways to learn and I bought a course, um, to teach me how to do it. So I did not start like work week lunch wasn't luck. Like I had this online business course that I took to learn how to build an audience and offer a product and like write copy. So, um, you know, between, and then I got let go from my writing job because, you know, the company got sold and I was doing consulting, but then work week lunch on the side and eventually it, it flipped like the consulting and freelancing became my side hustle and work week lunch became my full time. I think that's incredible. And I think it's incredible that you're honest about, hey, you know, this didn't happen overnight. This is something that I researched. Yeah, Yeah, like some people, you look at their success and you think, oh, they woke up one morning and they had 200,000 followers on Instagram, you know, but yeah, no, no. what is the most interesting thing you've learned so far as an entrepreneur? So far, it's been you get, you get out of it what you put in. Like, it's, it was really tough to grow work week lunch while working on other stuff. And now that it's my full time, I really can like feel it all coming back to me and it's growing a lot faster. And I didn't really like, no one ever really told me that going into it, you know, it's yeah. always, cause it's kind of like what you said, like you kind of read online all these like success stories of, oh, it just happened. And now was side hustling or I don't know. It didn't, you never really know how much work people actually put into these things. For sure. It becomes your, your life and it becomes something that did you have to, did you start to think when you went into becoming an entrepreneur and doing this full time, did you struggle with the work life balance? Was it hard to adjust to make your focus so much on building, building, building? Like, how did you do that? Oh man, I work like in the building stages when I was living in Colorado, mostly last year, I would do Instagram stuff all during the day and then work week lunch at night. And I would maybe get up, you know, get up to the slopes somewhere in there. And that was like my life for the whole year while building this. 
but it's I'm someone who will always work like that's my default and I have to do things to um actively pull myself out of it so my yeah my default is like I want to just work because there's always more to do as an entrepreneur um and I have to really be conscious of getting myself giving myself breaks (laughs) Yeah. It's not easy. No, those are hard, especially in New York City when you're now surrounded by everybody who's just work, work, work. It's yeah, it's definitely hard to find that balance. Well, I just want to avoid the subway, so I just work. Right. right <laughs> it's like, why go to a co-working space when you could just sit at home, not have yep. to deal with passing crazy people in the streets? I get it completely. <laughs> I want to end this podcast with a quick lightning round. I'm going to ask you some sure. questions, and uh, we'll see what you say. Are you ready? All right. I'm ready. When you were a kid, what did you want to grow up to become? An astronaut. Oh, I love it. Me too. I wish we would have done that, Talia. We would have been on the moon together. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> what do you think your dream job is now? Um, I want to just create Instagram content all day. <laughs> well, you do a good job at it. So keep, yeah. <laughs> please keep doing it. What advice do you wish that you can give yourself now that you would actually listen to? Take more bubble baths and meditate. <laughs> I love this. Okay, so this is not even part of the lightning round, but do you feel like people take baths in New York City? I feel like they don't, and they should. Um, I I know people that do it. I do a lot, so maybe we just have different circles of friends. I don't enough, though. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, well, I need to know these people because I always have a theory that New Yorkers don't bathe because their bathtubs are, like, historically gross, or they don't have bathtubs. But I like this. could be a business idea, Talia. (laughs) A bathing club for millennials. I like it. My final question for you, fill in the blank. You're not getting any younger, so... Don't ask for permission. Just get out there and do it. Oh, I love it, Talia. Please let our listeners know where they can learn more about you and Work Week Lunch. Sure. The best way to find me is on Instagram, at Work Week Lunch, all one word. You can DM me anytime. I answer all my DMs. You can also find me at workweeklunch.com and, you know, also Work Week Lunch on Facebook. And that's basically it. Love it. Thank you so much again, Talia. Thanks for having me. This is awesome. Hey, you. Thank you for listening to the You're Not Getting Any Younger podcast. There are hundreds of thousands of pods out there, so thank you for listening to this one. You can find the show notes for this week's episode up on our website, anyyounger.com. Subscribe, rate, and review that you're not getting any younger podcasts on iTunes so that other ears around the world can listen to. Oh, and join our secret You're Not Getting Any Younger Facebook group, where over 1,000 people are talking about how to disrupt their lives, for a good reason, to make it count. Until next week, all my love, Jen Glantz.